Good afternoon. Um, yes, my small consultancy, Aniglan, um, based here in Cardiff, um, supports the business development activities of fuel cell and hydrogen companies, and it falls on me to give a 15-minute or slightly less global tour of hydrogen and fuel cells. So it's going to be a whistle-stop tour of some of just some of the activities in hydrogen and fuel cells around the world. Um, I'll start with this, I'll come to this later um, in detail, um, but that gives a bit of a perspective from a European hydrogen road tour, uh, which I helped organize in the UK six years ago. Uh, I'm gonna now give you a whistle-stop global tour of some of the activities, um, but it gives you a, a time frame, and where will we be in six years, given that things, perhaps in the UK at least, haven't moved forward as quickly as, quickly as we anticipated back in in 2012. Um, this is some of my activities now. Uh, There's the Blue Gen Micro uh, CHP fuel cell. Uh, it's the box, uh, the white box, one and a half kilowatts. Now this is very high electrical efficiency, solid oxide fuel cell, and it's a punchy output. Uh, and that's one of the advantages of fuel cells. They do deliver and they work. And I'm not being flippant there, but these have been installed in numbers in Wales, in local authorities kick the tires with one and then repeat orders and that's the way things tend to work in this industry. People like to take uh, note of it, see that it works and then hopefully we can move to rolling out more of them. Um, and to, speaking of rolling out, Microsoft are very interested in these fuel cells now. It's the same box there you see, it's a server rack level and this provides the highest efficiency uh, that they can find in terms of using the gas as the input uh, and then providing that in DC output right at the server level. Um, are they, they're testing this in Seattle now at their um, research center there, but they're looking at potentially thousands of these being installed in order to power uh, data centers. So it just gives you an idea of the curve. You know, we're not talking about small numbers here, which is great, which is interesting, but it has to move at a, at a large global scale if it's gonna be of interest. Um, where's the link with transport? Well, you can use these to EV charge, and there's an example of that in Australia. Um, so if you have a large electrical demand, and I'll be showing a, a larger fuel cell in shortly, that you can use them to provide charging for electrical vehicles, and maybe <coughs> requiring gas as the infrastructure there and delivering electricity where you need it. Uh, this is the larger fuel cell, which I'm also involved with. This is now up to about half a megawatt of electrical output. Uh, a company called Doosan, who've installed these in numbers in Korea and also in the States where their factory is based. Uh, it's the old NASA technology, so the same phosphoric acid uh, technology in these fuel cells uh, helped get us to the moon in the 60s. I think it's still used on NASA's missions now, um, but they've, it's basically a big box. You can see on the left-hand side there's a door, so it's about two meters high, uh, so it could fit on this stage, it could power large parts of Cardiff with a box like that. Um, but, and that's essentially all it is. It's a box which has got the fuel cell inside, but at the beginning you have the, the steam methane reformer. So you get gas in, you get electricity and heat out at very high efficiencies. Um, and they're using these at scale again in Korea. Um, there's a computer image there of Busan, uh, a district of Busan anyway, and that city is now being built and is now being powered by this 30 megawatts or so uh, fuel cell plant right in the middle of the city. So you can, and there's not many technologies at scale that you can put right in the middle of cities where the energy is required to power those cities and perhaps connect to district heating as well. Um, but uh, Doosan are also developing a product now where you don't need the steam methane reformer. So it can take hydrogen as the input fuel which is perhaps interesting in terms of using chemically produced, uh, sorry, the chemical output byproduct of chemical industries. Um, and they've also developed in a configuration where you don't just get power and heat as the output, but from the uh, gas input fuel cell, you can have a slipstream of hydrogen as well. So you're into tri-generation technology there. Uh, power, heat, or cooling, and hydrogen from a gas-based input. Um, this is similar to fuel cell energies 
tri-generation plant, which is uh, working in Orange County in California. Um, but it shows you can have this distributed and as an alternative to other sources of producing hydrogen or storing it or using it locally from fuel cells. It's a clever box which does a lot of interesting things. Um, storage of energy. This is, you know, shooting up the agenda now. The graph here shows the different technologies. There's a couple of other ones besides this. But if you start on the left-hand scale, we're looking at flywheels and batteries and then moving on to hydrogen and SNG, which is essentially hydrogen, the source of that, synthetic natural gas, uh, and with compressed um, air, energy storage, and pumped hydro between the two. Now, it, it suggests this graph that, yeah, you can get quite a lot of storage from hydrogen, and you can have it at seasonal scale as well. Uh, the capacity is on the, uh, the y-axis, and the duration on the x-axis. Um, so it shows that hydrogen is a really useful medium for storage, but it doesn't tell the whole picture because this is a logarithmic uh, scale. So in reality, the storage capacity of hydrogen dwarfs some of these other technologies. John's uh, mentioned this in terms of the, uh, the London Eye, in terms of the storage capacity of hydrogen. Um, and I guess if this was a proper, proper linear scale, um, and this is not to denigrate some of the other technologies because they all have a place to play, perhaps the capacity of those would be very small on this wall and the hydrogen capacity would fill the wall or more. It's a logarithmic scale, remember. It shows the capacity and seasonal uh, um, ability of hydrogen to store energy. Kroisoi um, Gamri, you will understand this. This is GCSE-based water cycle. Um, so I don't need to translate any of those. You'll be familiar with this. All we're talking about with hydrogen from electrolysis is maybe just taking a little detour from the water cycle. Um, this is the great engine of our weather, and we use the, and the sun is the, the basis for all of that. So if you use just a small fraction of the sun in order to split water to produce hydrogen, and then recombine hydrogen with oxygen to produce water again, then a small fraction of this great water cycle can be used for our energy needs, um, as well as complementary ways of using, uh, of, of producing hydrogen, which will be with us for decades to come, I think, with all the investment in gas infrastructure across the world. Um, Shell were reporting last week that they're looking at an extra $200 billion of in infrastructure investment in LNG over the next uh, decade or two. So I don't think gas is going anywhere quickly, but this is perhaps the ultimate. Using the water cycle, taking a little detour of that, taking a small proportion of solar energy to produce hydrogen and store it and use it on a, on a global scale. And it has to be on a global scale if you're going to address some of these major challenges that we have. Um, I don't know the exact figure. It's something like if enough solar energy uh, falls on a, what is it, a postage stamp size in the Sahara Desert in... Uh, a second to power the entire Earth for a year. I know I'm exaggerating a little bit there, but there's a heck of a lot of solar energy available, and we only need to use a small fraction of that. Uh, John's covered some of this already. There's the Alstom famous picture again, for those of us in the industry. Um, but on the right, the Austrians are now ordering uh, hydrogen-based trains for their mountainous regions as well. For similar reasons, as John has mentioned, it costs a lot of money, and we've got a uh, um, bit of uh, knowledge of this in Wales with the end of the electrification line in Cardiff. Uh, the cost of electrification, especially on regional routes, is just prohibitive as far as the economics are concerned. And for the same reasons that they're doing it in Germany and in Austria, they're now beginning to roll out, and properly roll out, hydrogen trains. Um, the Chinese, that's a uh, Chinese train on the left, they're doing it for, perhaps for different reasons air pollution perhaps being the biggest driver there. Um, but you haven't just got one or two examples now. We've got a global uh, uh, movement in terms of developing hydrogen trains. A, a quote from the Ontario Minister of Transportation there, potential benefits of hydrogen fuel cells compared to overhead wires makes exploring hydrogen rail technology worthwhile. Great. In perhaps more straightforward Johnson language here in the UK, Roll on hydrogen trains in the UK. Joe Johnson was quoted just a couple of weeks ago. Hydrogen train to be tested in the UK by 2020. 
Not sure where yet, but it'd be nice to think that, as John suggested, some of those could be rolled out in, in Wales sooner rather than later. Um, there's the Aberdeen picture again. Fuel cell buses are here in the UK. There's many more. Cologne, I think, ordered a few last week. And many more cities in, in Europe and in the States and in China. And now in Ch and Japan are introducing fuel cell buses to their fleets. Top right, uh, this is Nikola. Um, now, this in a direct challenge to Elon Musk and Tesla. Um, the Nikola truck is now being manufactured in the States. And the company Nikola has invested $1 billion, I believe, in a manufacturing plant in Arizona. And they're not just producing the, the truck itself, which will have a range of, I think, 1,000 kilometers or more, but they're building the infrastructure around America and Canada as well to go with the, the truck. Um, there's the uh, van again there. Um, perhaps in Europe, we're still based on the grant-based uh, developments of large-scale rollups. Uh, the Connecting European uh, uh, Fund, um, $70 million, sorry, euros, has uh, paid for the Zero Emission Valley um, uh, trial in the French Alps regions. And I think air pollution is an issue there because the air pollution sits in the valleys. But you're looking at large-scale rollout there as well. Ten, 20 hydrogen stations and a fleet of about 1,000 vehicles. And they're being introduced right now. Um, but perhaps some of those larger hydrogen infrastructure developments, which, which is certainly happening elsewhere, perhaps they can help with the smaller scale ones as well. And this is one of the challenges of hydrogen infrastructure for cars, especially the cost and the, uh, the justification of doing that. Um, there's an image from the left of the European hydrogen rotor back in 2012, lining up, if I remember correctly, you've got Daimler, and Daimler gave me the keys to that car and said, okay, we'll see you in Bristol tomorrow morning. So it was parked outside my house overnight, probably cost more than my house. So by now, the cost of fuel cell cars has come down, uh, and I live, do live in a fairly small house in Cardiff. Um, then you've got Toyota, and then Honda, and Hyundai. Now, Toyota's car has developed quite a lot, as we'll see later, and so has Hyundai as well, and Honda's, and that's the next generation Hyundai picture again, the Nexo, which John has mentioned. But perhaps some of those larger scale stuff, especially in infrastructure, can support and justify the development of hydrogen filling station networks for the smaller users amongst us. There's a small network in the UK already, predominantly around London, no surprise there. Um, but in Germany, there's a national development extending into Denmark and his Cal uh, California connecting primarily San Francisco and Los Angeles. I cycled in here on my own zero emission two wheel uh, form of transport today. Um, and, but in Biarritz, they're developing a hydrogen bicycle there, and this is now being introduced to, I think, Cherbourg and a few other municipalities in France. So from the big, big scale right down to the small scale, it's the technology and the fuel is a common theme, and it can have so many different applications. Um, so the next time you drive on your summer holidays to Cherbourg in your diesel people carrier, and you come off a diesel ship, you may see some of these driving around, or uh, being um, uh, cycled around the streets of Cherbourg. Um, now into the justification territory, and be quickly on this in, in order to move on. This is a new report from the Ulich Research Center in Germany, which suggests, given on their research, that yeah, I know we're familiar with this, up to a certain point, battery electric vehicle infrastructure is perhaps uh, the way forward, and that's the current thinking. But the cost of hydrogen infrastructure is always uh, one of the reasons why it's perhaps being stymied. Can we justify the investment costs? Well, Ulich's uh, research suggests that, yeah, up to about a fleet size of about 100,000 vehicles, the battery electric vehicle infrastructure costs are the cheapest. But once you get into mass adoption, and this is somebody who's not particularly a big fan of cars, you know, I shouldn't be saying this in this audience, but I prefer if more people cycled and walked. But I think cars are going to be here for a while, and they're going to be here in numbers. Um, if you get up to about a million, then, and this is for Germany, the cost of hydrogen infrastructure is the, the more cost-effective option. But also, given my question, can the larger hydrogen users support and justify some of those costs which are being introduced as well? That's not to say we shouldn't have more battery electric vehicles. I was driven around in one a couple of weeks ago, and they accelerate like nothing, and I felt quite sick sitting in the back because there's a heck of a lot of talk there. 
and every single fuel cell car that I've seen and driven has a small battery in it anyway. Um, but, you know, we need to think about the big scale, the long-term infrastructure investment costs. Uh, and if we don't, these certainly are. China is really moving forward quickly on this space now. Um, I think just a couple of weeks ago, the National Alliance of Hydrogen and Fuel Cells was launched, and this is supporting China's hydrogen and fuel cell technologies reach mass markets, maturity and international competitiveness, which has repercussions for us here. Now, if China wants to do it, I'm sure they will do it, and they'll accelerate perhaps more quickly than, than we have. And maybe in a few years' time, we'll be seeing cars like that on, on our streets, uh, from SAIC, DFM, and my favorite name, the Great Wall Motor Company. Um, and just to underline that, Wuhan, a 11 million, I think, uh, uh, population city in China, that's scheduled to become a world hydrogen city by 2025, with lots of infrastructure, but also with an economic value output out of that as well. Um, and then it's a bold, it's even more bold than Joe Johnson, perhaps. We're going to be the hydrogen capital of the world. This is what South Australia is uh, aiming to do. This is the Air Peninsula, and there's a lot of resource there, solar resource and wind resource, but as well, gas infrastructure as well. And they're putting money into it now. There's a hydrogen roadmap, which has been produced from the South Australian government. And the great thing about hydrogen is it's universal. Hopefully, I've given a flavor of that. It can be applied globally. But the pathways to doing it are the same, pretty much, in much of the world as well. So maybe all we need to do is cut and paste out of the South Australian roadmap and insert our names here, and we can start to accelerate it here as well. On the bottom, I just wanted to mention this. We're talking about transport power and heat applications. But Australia and others are looking at hydrogen as renewable hydrogen towards fertilizer as well. So there's sustainable fertilizer, which can be produced out of renewable hydrogen. Just a couple more slides quickly. Um, John has mentioned the Leeds H21 uh, project. There's a new project, High Deploy, which I'm sure speakers will talk about shortly as well, about decarbonizing the gas infrastructure. We're always already on the pathway here in Cardiff. That's one of uh, my local streets. The yellow pipe works, which have been introduced by Wales and West gas utilities, these are compatible with hydrogen. Hyd hydrogen corrodes metal pipes, but these yellow pipes, plastic pipes, can take hydrogen. It's the end applications, the boilers, the fuel cells, as well as the connections injecting hydrogen. That's what's going to be tested, amongst other things, out of high deploy. There's a potential suggested pathway, which I've done as a piece of work for the Welsh government there, of using fuel cells as we decarbonize the gas network uh, to use it more cleanly and efficiently. And the French are on the game as well. This is a new study out of the French authorities um, looking at a 100% renewable gas mix by 2050. This includes methanization, not to be confused with methanation, uh, and pyrogasification, which there's a lot of hydrogen in there, but also power to gas in roughly thirds each. And they've done a nice gap around, uh, map around the districts of France to show how it can be done as well. A lot of solar in the south, a lot of power to gas, a lot of wind in the northwest, Brittany and elsewhere, uh, power to gas there, it suggests as well. Integration, hydrogen has lots of different applications. Um, this is a key topic now as well. How do we integrate these different energy networks? Well, hydrogen sits right in the big middle of that and at scale as well. And if those aren't good enough reasons to do it, the fuel cell was invented in Wales way back in 1842. There's some of the pictures of it as well. And Prime Minister Aibe from Japan um, is behind the Hydrogen Society there. And they, I think the Olympics will be used as a showcase for hydrogen and fuel cell technologies in just two years' time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.